His neck is very strong. And you, you, you look at this term neck, and God constantly wants us to break our necks spiritually so that we, we, we won't stand up against what God's trying to teach us. There's so many principles here. When you learn how to study the Bible, all these things are going to just open up to you, and you're going to understand how they apply to your spiritual life. And you're going to read the Bible and say, whoa, I need to be doing that, or I shouldn't be doing that, or I need to be sharing this. So that, that's what that's um, talking about. And also, when Jesus went into Jerusalem, what did he ride? He, he rode a donkey into Jerusalem, an, an ass, a wild ass. No one had ever ridden it before. Now, when they went to go get it, it was tied up to a post by a door. You read the passage. There's a door, and there's a post. The wild ass that no one had ever ridden is tied up to a post. What's the spiritual principle there? Remember, God doesn't waste words. Everything is for a reason. Okay, next week I'm going to bring you, I, someone brought me a Jehovah's Witness Watchtower, and there's an article I want you to read, and I want you to pick out the errors in their article, just as a way to see if you're getting a hold of these rules. Because we've studied every rule that I saw in this article. Okay, the wild ass is, of course, a picture of the lost man is tied up to sin, but the answer is the door. Jesus Christ. So they go and get this wild ass that's never been ridden before. No, nothing has ever been able to save this wild ass. So they bring to Jesus and he rides it for the first time into Jerusalem. Which means that whole story is telling us that Jesus came for us and he's the door. And if we will submit to him, we can have eternal life. And the story is all through that. I, just the other day I was talking to Connor and I'm going to start taking the stories from Genesis through Revelation and showing how these applications fit and hopefully put that into a book form in the future. But just show the doctrinal, devotional, and spiritual applications to Adam and Eve, what the trees represent, and just keep, keep, keep going with it and put them all down in story form. Um, then another way God teaches is let's go to um, um, E. Psalm 58.9 Proverbs 1, 26, 27, in these verses, many times in the Bible a whirlwind is used to describe the second coming. In Psalm 58, before your pots can fill the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. I also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, as the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is as an everlasting foundation. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire unfolding itself. And brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire. So we see the whirlwinds can be used for two reasons that we see. To describe the second coming and describe judgment. That's also what lightning is used for. It's a picture of God's judgment. Ezekiel 1, 13-14. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. I went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Lightning is the judgment of God, which is always just, by the way. He's, God's not fair. I mean that. God's not fair. He's just. If He were fair, where do I deserve to go? I deserve to go to hell. But because he's just, he's given me a way of escape. So when we talk about judgment, we need to also realize that God is just. Um, another principle to look at is rain is like the word of God. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth the bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And then we also see thunder is likened unto the voice of God. And if you read these verses in your notes, Job that hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like unto Him? When you see, when you hear thunder, just remember that's a picture of the voice of God. It's, it's a majesty. It's awe. Just last week we heard a lot of thunder, and when you think of the voice of God and His glory and His majesty, and then sin is likened unto a multitude of people. And the last one in Revelation 28, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. So the sand of the sea is a type of the nations of the earth. And then stars are likened into angelic beings. 
We see that in Job 38 and verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Sons of God in the Old Testament prior to um, Adam were angels. So now then, then you had the Son of God which was Adam. Then you had the Son of God which was Jesus. And today when we accept Christ it says, Beloved are you now the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Well we know that we, wish, we shall see him. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So we are the sons of God today, just like Jesus was the Son of God, just like Adam was the Son of God, and just like the angels were the Son of God. There's only been four sons of God in this earth. And I'm going to throw this out at you, and I'm going to close with this. And then you can look at these um, on page 40. You have all these different universal and earthly types of the Godhead imprinted on the universe. So I want you to really take a look at that. But, okay, when Lucifer fell, we discussed, we discussed this last week. At what, what percentage of the angels fell with them? The third. There's a gap. There's a gap in the sons of God. Because angels were the first sons of God. And God does everything decently in order. And there's original Jerusalem, there's going to be a new Jerusalem. There's a gap missing, a third of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God today? Yeah. We are. I believe this with all my heart. I believe, I don't know the day that the rapture will happen, but I know the event that will trigger the rapture to happen. You think you know where I'm going with this? You know <laughs> Okay. When that last believer, who is the Son of God, fills the gap of angels that fell and followed Lucifer, whatever number that is, that's it. And he's going to come back for his bride. It will be complete. Because Ecclesiastes even tells us that. What was shall be. And there's nothing new under the sun. God does everything decently and in order. So we don't know what that date is, but wouldn't it be wonderful? If you could be that person who won that Son of God to Christ and that ushered and triggered in the timing for the rapture. And God knows when that's going to be and it's all going to fit His timing. And He knows when the peace accord with Israel is going to be signed by the Antichrist. He knows all that. He's seen it happen before. And that just would be a, a marvelous thing. If you could usher in, then seven years later, the utopian society will finally be upon this earth for a thousand years. And you had a major part in seeing that that happened. That would be awesome. So never, you know, that divine appointment that you walked by could have been it. You know, you could have helped us usher in what everybody's been waiting for for all these years is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his eventual return. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, your word. And you're so practical. It's not hard to understand. It's hard to believe. When we get to the point where we believe every word, understanding will come because the Holy Spirit's the teacher. But when we start when we try to understand the Bible without submitting to the Holy Spirit, that's when we fall into problems and that's when we try to change it and make it simple. And we take the Holy Spirit out of the equation. Where when the Bible teaches us, if we submit to the Holy Spirit, he'll teach us all things. It's as simple as that. And it just shows how man doesn't want to submit to the authority of the Word of God. So God help us to be Christians that submit to your authority. And, and so you can teach us so that we can make a difference in our worlds. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, any questions on... Today's was pretty straightforward, but any, any questions?